Written recipes won't teach you to cook any more than having sheet music will teach you how to play piano. And for home cooks, there are 16 cooking rules that you should never follow because they're ruining your cooking. Today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Welcome back, everyone, to the Carefree Cooks Code. It's Tuesday at noon in the East, and that's when we're together, always live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If this surprises you, you should go to webcookingclasses.com slash, uh, wrong slash again, slash live <laughs> and register for my free alert system. And that way you'll know when I'm going live because we're the carefree cooks. We create our own recipes. We bring family and friends together over this. We learn every time we cook. It's one of my favorite things about cooking this way uh, because you wind up defining your own cooking style while you practice pro methods and you wind up really loving your cooking. And that's what I find so much fun. Welcome everyone. All our friends are back with us today. Kimberly is here and Terrence. Hi, Deb from Hot 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 Houston. Hi, Candy and Carrie and Michael and Donald and Colleen and Jerry and Guy and Carol and Sandra and uh, 122 people right now and scrolling upward. Normally it's 200 or more. And if you have friends, I mean, if you're with us every Tuesday and you love what's going on here, please tell your friends about it. We're trying to change the world. It's, it's another happy Tuesday and it's become my favorite day of the week because we get together again. Um, I've got a, a true or false for you again today. Uh, read this statement. The statement is, a chicken labeled roaster should always be roasted. A chicken labeled roaster should always be roasted. Tell me in the comments section below, is that statement true or false? Just need one word, true or false, in the comment section below. So, summer is coming to an end, everyone. Uh, it makes me sad sometimes because the heat starts to subside. But you know what's really cool? That fall cooking is coming our way. And I get really excited whenever the seasons change here in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, I live in a place where the seasons do change. I understand there are places where they don't, but you can just go along with us because when the seasons change, that's when my cooking changes also. It, it's the time, you know, for uh, those soups, right? Okay, I'm, I'm sad I'm not grilling anymore. I, I, you know, the hot dogs and hamburgers, I've had enough of them maybe. But now I've got soups. I've got stews. I've got casseroles and squash and pumpkin and, and warm cinnamon stick drinks, you know? Fall is a great time. And I'm not even going to mention that stupid pumpkin spice, mostly because I'm really sick of it. So you like pumpkin spice? Fine. I, I try and ignore it <laughs> because I'm bucking the trends. But look, no matter how your cooking changes for the season, no matter what you decide to cook, I can tell you that you've been misled for quite a while. And, you know, I might even say that you've been lied to for many years because there are a whole bunch of cooking rules that are just myths and misconceptions about how cooking works. And these things have led home cooks down the wrong path for years and years and years. And I've identified 16 of these cooking rules that may have been ruining your cooking all these years. And these are the 16 rules 
that you should never follow. So stay with me if you want to take out a pen <laughs> and start jotting them down. You'll have your own anti-cookbook, the things that you should not do. And the first rule is the one that is the most damaging. And this is the one, Julia Child, uh, Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet, uh, the New York Times section, Betty Crocker. This is the one that has been taught to home cooks for decades and decades, and it is the single one that has ruined more cooking than anything else. And this is the idea of cooking by time. This is the first rule that you should ignore. Don't cook by time. I mean, when the recipe says cook for 20 minutes, saute for three to five minutes, I mean, how do they know these things? How do they know how hot my stove gets? How do they know what kind of pans I'm using? How do they know how thick my chicken breast is compared to the ones that they're using? Wherever the recipe was written, I guarantee it wasn't in my kitchen, you know? If I'm following somebody else's recipe, the test kitchen is inherently different than your own kitchen, unless you have a test kitchen in your house, which I doubt you do. So all kitchens, they all have unique qualities that make following recipes that much difficult, more difficult from the start. And this is the first rule that you should ever, never follow. If your pans are different, if they heat at different rates, how can you cook by time? And you know, common sense tells you that if one chicken breast is twice as thick as the other chicken breast, well, the first one's gonna take twice as long to cook. And if all chicken breasts are different sizes because they're not made in a factory, how do you cook by time? If all stoves heat differently, how can a recipe be written that commands you to cook by time? It's a rule you should never follow because you cook with your eyes. You observe the changes in the food. You make the decisions. You don't let the clock make the decisions for you. Rule number two that you do not ever have to follow is when you're told to find a specific pan or a piece of uh, equipment. I mean, what if you're baking brownies and you don't have the 9 by 17 pan exactly. Can you new, use a aluminum 9 by 17 pan instead of a glass one? Or is it more important to have the glass pan and just use a smaller one? Oh my God, it gets confusing, right? What does it matter? I mean, ultimately, you have to know the different qualities of heat conduction in these things to make these decisions. Glass is a really poor conductor of heat. It doesn't take the heat on really well, but it retains it really well. In other words, it takes a while to get hot, but it also takes a while to cool down. And this is great for your casseroles. This is why people put their casseroles in a glass pan. This is why uh, the neighborhood potluck dinner has glass casserole pans everywhere, because it is a benefit to baking casseroles and, and keeping them hot, but it's actually a detriment to baking sweet items. So while the pan size in a recipe is an indicator of the resulting volume of the ingredients that the recipe is going to produce, and you can also add them up with a calculator, ultimately you can use any size pan you want. I mean, think about this. Could you make corn muffins out of a cornbread recipe? Sure you could. You're just switching pans. But if you did that, does that mean the ma that magically the recipe is not going to work now? Just because you used a different pan? No, no, no. Mixing is entirely different than panning in baking, and I don't ever listen to recipes that command me to use a specific pan or a specific piece of equipment. It's a rule that I never follow. Number three is these vague, unquantifiable measurements and terms. They drive me nuts. How many times do I see one onion chopped? Oh my goodness. I've seen onions that are the size of grapefruits. I've seen onions that are size of cherries, you know? Given that range, what exactly is a medium onion? One medium onion chopped, are you kidding me? The best, the most wholesome ingredients aren't consistent in size. Onions aren't made in a factory. And when a recipe calls for an ingredient by a relative size, you are aligned for instant disappointment. Onions, garlic, peppers, celery, carrots, broccoli, even pea-sized peas <laughs> have a wide range of sizes. You know, you say pea-sized, but peas have different sizes. And the recipe doesn't ever take this into account. Even if I have an onion that I consider perfectly medium, 
Look, I still use as much or as little of the onions as I want. It has more to do with taste. So how can you be expected to cook just like the recipe when all the ingredients are different sizes? Don't ever follow a rule that has an amount that you can't quantify. Fourth are these vague warnings, these instructions, and they sound like cooking rules, but they're really impossible to follow. Things like don't overmix. What does that look like? You know? Don't overcook. Well, no, I hadn't planned on overcooking. Cook until done. I see these words in recipes all the time, and it's not that I love to overmix things or I love to overcook my food. They just don't ever tell you what this means in a recipe. Overmixing, right? Don't overmix. Overmixing is relative. In a yeast dough product, you want to mix for an extended period of time because you're developing gluten. Think of like a, a bagel or a French bread. But then think about a cake. Cake should not be chewy like French bread. And cake mixing is a more delicate process of combining the ingredients and forming an emulsification with the fat. This is something that doesn't happen in a lot of breads without developing the gluten. So you know, once you know that, you're able to, to quantify with the visual cues of overmixing. And this is going to give you much better results that you can duplicate again and again and again. And this is again where the clock comes in. You know, mixing for eight to ten minutes, any recipe is going to contradict itself when it says mix for eight to ten minutes, but then it says don't overmix. Well, which is it? <laughs> what if I mix for six minutes and the batter looks perfect? Should I keep mixing because you told me 8 to 10? Or if I mix to 8, which is the bottom level that you told me, do I run the risk of overmixing? And I haven't even reached 8 minutes yet. You know, I mean, when you really think about it, it seems so absurd to just follow these directions blindly when you can empower yourself with being able to recognize when something is overmixed or overcooked or when it's done. And I don't ever listen to vague warnings from a recipe. It's a rule that I ignore every single time. Number five is all about having to use a specific cut of meat or a specific ingredient. Look, I have control over the ingredients I want to include in my cooking. If a recipe calls for onions, heck, I'll use shallots if I want, all right? The heck with you, <laughs> recipe. Chicken marsala, uh, it can be made with boneless chicken breasts. It can be made with thigh meat. It can be made with bone-in leg meat. Don't let the recipe tell you what kind of chicken. Beef stroganoff can be uh, made with top round sliced. Uh, sirloin, you can even use ground beef if you want, because I use the ingredients that I like most, the ones that I have on hand most often, and I never let a recipe drive me to buying more stuff at the grocery store. Recipes love to command you to buy stuff. When you become familiar with the, the families of ingredients, then you can start to make substitutions. Then you can really get creative and you can start to swap out uh, spinach for escarole. Uh, instead of carrots, which can be kind of boring, get daikon. Uh, you want to get really crazy? Swap out an ostrich steak for your beef. Try it because ultimately recipes are really just one person's opinion of how something should be cooked, and there is no rule forbidding you from changing the ingredients. Now, baking is precise in its measurements, but you do not have to measure things in cooking. And this is the sixth rule you can go ahead and ignore because your mouth is going to tell you the truth about it. To experience true freedom in cooking, forget the measurements. Your cooking should be guided how the food tastes and how it looks. And if your desire to complete the dish as the recipe defines it, you're going to be distracted from the true art in cooking. If you're blindly following instructions, you're not enjoying. You're not developing your kitchen skills. I mean, come on. Will one tablespoon of soy sauce instead of a half tablespoon of soy sauce really ruin your dish? Not if you like soy sauce twice as much as the recipe author does, then it's perfect. This obsessive concern over precise measurements in cooking is absolving yourself of the responsibility. Because then you can always say, hey, the recipe didn't work. It wasn't me. It was the recipe. Sorry, but if the recipe will never work exactly, then it's up to you to interpret it to your liking. Because a recipe never will 
work exactly. Take back the control. Stop measuring. Don't follow this rule that takes away your creativity. Seventh, uh, you don't want to have a, a specific name brand product in a recipe. If it tells you you got to use a specific brand, ignore it. I shop for ingredients for different reasons than the recipe author might. You know, uh, let's say you see a recipe in Cooking Light magazine. They're going to have a different approach to jambalaya uh, when Zatarin's Rice is an advertiser in their magazine, and their audience is calorie conscious. But if you look up the same recipe in Low Country Cooking <laughs> magazine that has a jambalaya recipe from Billy Bob's Fatback Shop, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be entirely different, right? Be suspicious of any recipe that tells you to buy a certain product because it really doesn't matter. Next, uh, you can also ignore the order of the ingredients in a recipe. Recipes always confuse the order of cooking with the priority of ingredients. Neither have anything to do with creating great meals. You can change the order of the ingredients in cooking, and it's one of the ways to control the final flavor and texture of a meal. Let me give you an example. Garlic is a perfect example. If you saute raw garlic in hot oil as the first step in your recipe, the garlic's going to be very subdued. It's going to be sweeter. It might even be toasty and brown. But if you take raw minced garlic and you sprinkle it on the food at the very end of your cooking, you're going to have a sour, very pungent flavor. Neither is right, neither is wrong, but you decide which flavor you want in your creation. You do not have to set out for the destination that the recipe is pointing to. You can change the flavor of these ingredients in any recipe by altering the order in which they appear. The eighth rule reminds me that I can change the path to success. I can ignore the rules to tell me what order things should proceed in. The eighth rule that you should never follow in cooking. All right, halfway through, how are we doing? Uh, who else is joining us now? All our old friends. I see Vicky is with us now. Scroll down. Oh my goodness, a lot of scrolling. Hi, Anne. Hi, Sandra. Dan is here. Carrie's checking in. There's 210 people with us now, twice as many as we started. How am I doing? Is this blowing your mind a little bit? A little bit? A little bit? Blowing your mind a little? I mean, can, can you hear your mom or your grandma telling you some of these rules? They've been around forever. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. I'm not blaming your mom or your grandma. Everybody did this because nobody knew any better. But now we do. Now we can decide how and what we cook and eat and not believe some ancient myths. So let's move on. All right, number nine. Number nine is cooking items together. This is the rule that has ruined more dinners than any other. It's the rule that the recipe will tell you about cooking everything at the same time. And I ignore this rule immediately because it defies logic to me. The recipe that instructs me to saute onion, garlic, and carrots as the first step is not taking into consideration that these are all different ingredients, but they're being treated coldly the same. Carrots are much harder than celery. Garlic cooks much more quickly than onions in the same pan. And so if I were to follow this rule and I was throwing garlic, onion, celery, carrot in the pan at the same time, I would always have burnt garlic, crunchy onions, and hard carrots. I always add the ingredients I'm cooking separately. I assure that everything is at the exact level of doneness, try and preserve the nutrition and wholesomeness of the food before I move on to the next step. That's why the best stir fry, they use blanching or par cooking first to get everything to a precise doneness, then they meet the wok or the high heat. And any rule that tells me to combine ingredients takes away my ability to cook things well. I ignore them. I never follow them. Rule number 10, you can ignore entirely. Now, let's move on to rule number 10. If you've been with me since 2008, when I started teaching online, more than 11 years ago now, you might have heard me say more than once, don't cook with water. Water is the most flavorless thing on the planet, next to air, that is, and I don't follow an instruction in a recipe that advises me to cook with water any more than I would, <laughs> I would follow a recipe that told me to add air, right? What if I wrote you a recipe and it said, uh, you know, blow some air over it? It's not going to affect the flavor. I always cook with broths and stocks. 
They add flavor to the cooking rather than remove flavor from the cooking. Shrimp poached in water has the water taste like shrimp and the shrimp taste like water. You ever notice when you cook your carrots in water, the water is orange and all the flavor and nutrition of the carrots is in the water too? I mean, you will drown in bland dishes if you follow any cooking rule that tells you to add water. All right, moving along, because we got to get to all of them now. It's the 11th rule that you might be following by mistake. And this is the command to season to taste in a recipe. I know seasoning to taste is very important, but sometimes I see it at the beginning or the middle of the recipe, and i got to go, huh? What are you talking about? This is where recipes potentially aren't just leading you astray. This is where recipes might be trying to kill you. And I don't season or taste until just before the dish is finished. That's when it takes place. I've read recipes that have you taste marinades with raw ingredients in them. That's just plain dangerous. Tasting doughs with, with raw egg, potentially hazardous. And come on, if your pasta sauce is going to simmer for five hours, it's not going to help you to taste it in the first 10 minutes. Because through the reduction, the evaporation of liquids, the flavors are going to change dramatically. They're going to intensify. And this season to taste early in cooking is going to have you putting basil and oregano into a pasta sauce that then is going to simmer for hours and it's going to be entirely different after you added that stuff. It might be too strong. So I always create a dish for a specific flavor profile early in the cooking process by using the best ingredients, the best aromatic vegetables, but I season with herbs and spices at the very end to make sure that the dish is balanced. Any cooking rule that has you seasoning and tasting to season early on, it's a useless rule. You should ignore it every time. Number 12 is going to have you paying attention to the photo instead of the method. Don't ever pay attention to a recipe photo. <laughs> if you are trying to create a dish to look just like the photo in the recipe book, you're going to be wasting a lot of food in your attempts because I've got a truth for you here. Uh, the photo was taken in a photo studio by a food stylist and the recipe was written in a test kitchen. The two have never met. <laughs> the two have never met before. And if you think this is the case, it's gonna set you up for poor expectations and deep disappointment. And there is no rule that says your cooking has gotta look like a photo so you don't need to follow it. When it looks good to you, then it's done and it's good. And look, similarly, you don't have to pay attention to the title of a recipe or the adjectives that it uses. And the lucky 13th rule you should never follow is cooking for the title. Zesty chicken. <laughs> hey, you see something like this? Zesty chicken. No, it's not zesty until my taste buds tell you that it's zesty. Titles of recipes that, that, that have these great descriptors, that they make it sound like an instruction when it's not. And they shouldn't be confused with a guaranteed desired outcome either. Quick and easy chicken very often <laughs> is neither quick nor easy. And with the shortcuts that, that they try and make you do, a lot of times it doesn't taste like chicken either. Right? It's just a cheap way to cook. Recipe titles that build your expectations falsely is a rule that never should be followed. Okay, we're almost there. People are checking in. Grammy is with us. That's good. Grammy season's at the end. Peggy is with us. Imelda is here. Hi, Imelda. Birdie, too, from Canada. All right, we're getting to the end. The oldest myth in all of cooking is this one coming up next. And rule number 14 would have you poking, guessing, gashing items open to tell if they're done. There is only one way to quantifiably tell if your steak, your chicken, your pork, your fish, any other protein product is cooked to your liking and it's not by poking it with your finger and then poking your cheek or something or poking your hand. Oh, it's so ridiculous. It drives me insane. When students come to culinary college with this idea, I, I just want to send them to the principal's office, you know, just until you can figure out that that's the dumbest thing ever. Everybody's hands are different. Everybody's cheeks are different. Meaning that if two people 
check the same steak for doneness using this method, the skinny guy's steak is going to be well done, and the fat guy's steak is going to be rare. It's just silly. A digital instant read thermometer is the only way to tell when your items are cooked. And you've heard me say it a thousand times. You know, some people have that sleep number. They have the adjustable feature of their bed. I don't have a sleep number. I have a steak number. It's way more important to me. And using a thermometer, my steak is perfect at 128 degrees Fahrenheit. I let it travel a little bit afterward. That's just like I like it. It comes out the same way every time. So ignore this silly wives tale rule. Get yourself a thermometer and learn doneness temperatures. Forget about poking your hand or your cheek. It's a rule you should never follow. And the next thing you can totally forget about is yields in a recipe. Number 15 that you can forget about that you never have to follow is this rule that says uh, serves six to eight people. Well, the difference between six and eight is 25 percent and immediately you have a considerable margin for error. For error. Uh, in my catering company or as somebody responsible for food cost in a big hospital, if I was off by 25 percent, I'd be out of a job. Now, the way to overcome this is knowing your family's basic portions. This is going to empower you to ignore this rule of cooking because you're going to observe the yields that your family actually eats. There are standard portion sizes for the average adult. We talked about this two weeks ago in great detail. So go watch that show if you want to know more about it. Know your portions and you can ignore the rule about how much it serves, about yields. Lastly, right at the end, the 16th cooking rule that you should never follow is using processed, altered, faked food. Why bother cooking with engineered ingredients? Just eat the engineered ingredient is the way I look at it. True and enjoyable flavor of real foods cannot be duplicated it cannot be sacrificed, even in the pursuit of a health goal. Eat real food for your health goal. Because so many of these ingredients, they've been shown to have the direct opposite effect of what they promise. The low-fat items can make you crave more fat. They keep you hungry as your body tries to decipher, what the heck did I just eat? It doesn't understand the fake ingredients. Half of the amount of real butter will have four times the true flavor as twice as much as margarine. Okay, that's not a formula. <laughs> that's hyperbole. That's opinion. Half the amount of butter will yield four times the enjoyment as twice as much margarine. You can spread as much margarine on a piece of bread as you want. I'm still going to hate it. Use real foods. Composed processed meats, formed chicken cutlets. They're usually loaded with salt and fillers. They give you less than 100% of meat in your meat. Okay, and also, look, cooking is a scientific endeavor. Fats are used in saute to transfer heat from the pan to the ingredients. Fats have different smoke points. They break down at different temperatures. They render good or bad flavors, but margarines, margarines burn quickly. You shouldn't use it for saute. And fake meats won't render fats for flavorful saute, and they won't be a good basis for a gravy. The rule of using fake ingredients as an endeavor toward health, convenience, or even cost should be ignored. Look, because ultimately, I'm not trying to scare you, <laughs> but the recipe deck is, deck is stacked against you. We've all had recipes that just don't come out right, and it's because these rules... They, they give them to you like, like they're, you know, they should be absolute, but they're inconsistent, they're vague, they're unquantifiable, they're variable, they're wasteful, and they set you up for disappointment. So if your mom or your grandma didn't teach you to cook, you're unfortunately left to recipe books and celebrity chefs on TV. And the problem is that neither of these actually teaches you how to cook. And I used to call MT, I used to call the food uh, TV the MTV of food, right? MTV, back in the day, they used to play music. Now they're entertainment about music. And the food TV, they're entertainment about food. They don't teach anybody to cook. And I've seen the change made in thousands of people's lives when they examine how cooking works and stop following instructions. I'm not talking about, you know, following new recipes or spending a lot of money on cookbooks. What I'm talking about is true freedom in understanding the basic 
methods that go into cooking. So when you learn how to saute, it doesn't matter if it's chicken or shrimp or tofu or beef or vegetables, it is all the same. Ignore these antiquated and misleading rules of cooking, learn how cooking works, and a whole new lifestyle will open for you. All right, <laughs> I, I just want this for you. You know, I hope you know, I know I'm editorializing. I hope I'm not being preachy. It's just I want it for you so badly. It's a better life. But speaking of better life, let's go to our Carefree Cooks community on Facebook. Now more than 9,000 lifetime members of, of web cooking classes are in our Carefree Cooks community. It is so cool. We just broke the 9,000 mark last week. So let's see on the topic today, who is breaking rules in cooking? And the first is Rosie. Uh, Rosie says her latest creation. I like anyone who uses the term creation. She made zucchini, avocado, and mint brownies topped with ganache and chocolate sauce. Who says you can't use avocado in a brownie, right? As long as you know the mixing method for brownies, then you can choose whatever you want. Next is Cheryl. Cheryl did a roasted carrot and ginger soup with a side of salmon. She didn't need any instructions for this because she knows the method for a pureed soup. And Paul says, hey, yeah, I know you can buy them in the can, but I didn't want to do that. And his onion strings are much better than the can type, I can promise you that. Paul won't follow the rule that says that you need to buy brand names. Why would he when he can do it himself? Bob made a crab meat pie. I don't know what that is, but I want one. <laughs> it just, it stopped my scrolling crab meat pie. I'm going to have to ask Bob how he did it. And I'm not sure what rule Carla's seafood bisque broke, uh, but I just wanted to see the picture of it again. Uh, she, she said her daughter loves a good bisque, so she made the seafood bisque for her. She made her daughter happy. That's got to be a rule that you should follow. Make other people happy. So until we meet again next Tuesday, I want you to be a bit of a rebel this week. This is your assignment. How many cooking rules in the following week can you break? How many rules that you don't know why you've been following them can you start to ignore? I want you to be a rule breaker this week. Do it. Go ahead. Uh, are true or false? Uh, the roaster chicken, a chicken labeled roaster should always be roasted. No, that's false. A chicken labeled roaster is an indicator of its age. It's not a suggestion on how to cook it. If a chicken is labeled roaster, that means it's between 8 and 12 weeks of age. It is either sex, and it's at least 5 pounds of weight when it goes to slaughter. So no, you do not have to roast a roaster for sure. Hey, let me ask you this. Do you know someone who is uh, following ancient, antiquated rules in their cooking? and they don't know why, <laughs> well, go ahead, please share this video with them or like it so everybody can know that it's helpful and it's going to help people as well. And if you're looking forward to joining the 9,000 of us by beginning your own culinary journey toward becoming a carefree cook, get my guidebook, The Five Forks to Carefree Cooking, and you can begin your own path. I will help you make the decisions at each fork in the road to help you become a great carefree cook. This is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there may not be any rules, but there is a method to your cooking success. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.